There we go. So we will get our kickoff moving. So hello, everybody. I'm really excited to see everybody today. Today's class is all about the AP government founding documents. So if you don't know what AP government is, this is a course that many high schoolers take around the country and around the world, to be honest, um, or a version of the AP course. And it's called AP GOPO. That's what most teachers and schools call it. And it is either a half year or a full year course from the College Board on America's um, founding ideas, founding government. One of the big things that is in the test that they have at the end of the term, be it again, a half year or a full year, is reviewing the founding documents, looking at similarities and differences. So what we're gonna do today in this class from the National Constitution Center is go over those founding documents one by one, examine what they say, what they mean, how they work, and then connect it to the bigger ideas. So my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'll be here to kind of guide us through this review. I will also be joined by Jeff Rosen, who will really kind of dig deep in each document and go through each one. Um, but I wanted to kind of kick us off and start us thinking before he gets here and our brains start turning around these documents. If you have any questions as we go through, please let me know. You can check out um, our web page that has tons of tools and resources on this. I'm gonna drop the links in here again. The first link will focus on uh, a worksheet that we built that you can annotate as you go along today. So you can go in your Google Drive and open it up if you wanna do that or print it out later. And you can annotate and take notes from class day. The second link brings you to the toolkit page on this. And on that toolkit page, you will find everything. You'll find all the slides, you'll find the worksheets, you'll find past videos. You will also find a briefing document, which our running joke here is it's every, anything but brief. It is really detail oriented and it's really intense and we'll go through all those materials. So as Jeff comes in the room, let me just text him and make sure he has the right link. Good, okay. He is walking in now. Um, I wanna start kind of looking at these things. So as you understand kind of looking at these 10 different documents in the, the founding period, one of the things that we really engage with with the AP exam and to be, to be clear and transparent, the National Constitution Center was a part of the writing team that helped develop the AP Gov framework that schools use. Now we know not everybody in this class today is from an AP Gov class, and that's great. These are 10 great documents, and in these 10 great documents, everybody can find something to learn. So we know that some of our students are um, in middle school. We know some of our students are in high school, in an AP class, in a non-AP class. We know our, some of our students are lifelong learners or getting their GAD. So welcome to everybody as you come in. Hold on one second, sorry. Uh, making sure everybody has what they need. So first, as we, I'm gonna go over kind of overview and then we'll dive into each document. So the first things first, when we look at the United States Declaration of Independence, what the big idea for the AP exam is to hold around this document is to really understand and hold on to the idea that this is a, a document that was influenced by the Enlightenment period and really spells out this idea of popular sovereignty rule of law, as well as natural rights. And that's a key thing that we're going to do. Now I'm going to make Jeff Rosen co-host so he can pick up from here and jump in. There he is. Hi, Curry. Sorry to be late and great to see you. Great to see you too. Don't worry. We were just looking at the 10 founding documents that we're going to go over today. And a lot of our students are prepping for that AP exam, but a lot of our students are not. And they are really interested in these 10 documents. So I promise Colin and others that we're going to get through all 10. So are you ready for the speed round, Jeff Rosen? I think I'm almost ready, but are we going to start with the declaration? We are going to start with the declaration, so go right ahead. Well, friends, we know the famous first uh, lines, and I'm going to recite them from memory. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and whenever 
government becomes this destructive of these rights, it's the right and duty of the people to alter and abolish it. So three, three big ideas in this crucial document, and those are natural rights, popular sovereignty, and the rule of law. And remember what a natural right is. It's something that is inherent in who I am uh, as a human being. I'm born with it. It's not given to me by the government. And I can't alienate or surrender it to anyone, including Curry or you or the government, because the quintessential natural right is my freedom of conscience. And I can't give anyone else the power to think for me because I have the right and obligation to think for myself. And popular sovereignty, of course, is ruled by we the people. All laws are only legitimate if they uh, are passed with our consent. And um, the rule of law is the third big idea. And that really has to do with um, governments uh, ensuring that laws are prospective. They are neutrally applied. In other words, they can't be bent to the will of one king or president or dictator. And the rule of law includes with it an idea of constitutionalism and the separation of powers, that basically one person can't have all the power because we the people have the power. So that's why we separate the branches of government to ensure that the people rather than the king rules. I think that's it for the declaration, Curry. How did I do? I think you did perfect. There's just two things that I know that are on the test that I'd love you to add. A little bit about the grievances listed and how it connects to social compact theory or contract theory and the writer. The grievances and what was the second one? Uh, social contract theory and then who was the writer of this document? Ah, well, the writer was, of course, Thomas Jefferson, um, although he said that he wasn't being original. He was just uh, synthesizing ideas from Aristotle, Cicero, John Locke and others. and he was on a committee with Thomas Jefferson and uh, with uh, Ben Franklin and, and John Adams and, and others. Um, and his grievances were centrally connected to the idea of social contract theory because the idea was that the king has our allegiance in exchange for protection. Um, we obey him and in exchange, he protects our rights. But because he hadn't protected our rights and he'd ignored our petitions, and that's why the right of petition and assembly is so important. Um, we renounce our allegiance and are exercising our original natural right to alter and abolish government. So that's why social compact theory is such a um, crucially limited and or rather related to the right to alter and abolish government. The right of revolution is the way of ensuring that the king or the president or the government keeps its end of the bargain. And that's what the declaration said that Thomas, that the king didn't do. Thank you. Uh, now we dive into our governing document prior to the Constitution. Well, the Articles of Confederation were um, a loose assembly of sovereign states. And the states were so keen to protect their sovereignty that they denied the central government any powers. In, in order to act, you needed unanimous consent. The articles lack the power to make and enforce treaties, to conduct foreign policy. And as a result, they weren't very effective and we couldn't pay the army. George Washington is asking for funds at Valley Forge. And things like Shays' Rebellion, which was a group of debtors who were rioting in Western Massachusetts, uh, were allowed to take place without the power um, to easily restore the rule of law. So that's why the Articles of Confederation were a kind of negative example of how it wasn't enough just to declare independence and say that you have to have natural rights, but you need a way of enforcing those through a written constitution with the separation of powers and with a vigorous executive, with a strong but constrained Congress, and perhaps most important of all, with an independent judiciary that could ensure that the rule of law was neutrally enforced. And that brings us perfectly to they weren't working. So we have a constitutional convention that leads to what amazing document? Well, I think it leads to the constitution and anyone <laughs> who's been in these classes knows all about it. What do we, how, how can we sum up the constitution for our AP friends, uh, Curry? 
which I do like remember us having so much trouble keeping a short definition of the constitution. But I think what you said so perfectly there is that it's a government that gives power, but also limits power and separates power. So this idea that it is how our government and how our institutions work by spelling out jobs, specificities, structure of government and also limits on government as well. So I think that when we talk about the original constitution or the structural constitution, that's the big idea that comes out there. That seems perfectly said. I couldn't say it better myself. <laughs> that was easy. Now, not everybody loved the original constitution. Even the people that helped build it, they instantly found flaws with it. And that leads us lovely to our next document and the story of the dissenters. Do you want to talk about who, a few of them, not the only ones, that thought that something was missing from the Constitution? Absolutely. We, I always uh, remember the dissenters along with you, Curry, because we have them standing in the back of Signers Hall at the Constitution Center. And they were led by George Mason of Virginia and Edmund Randolph of Virginia and Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts. And remember, friends, you can always pronounce it El gerrymandering rather than gerrymandering. And irritate your friends who think you're being, uh, you know, a kind of know-it-all because it's uh, a kind of obscure, but um, Jerry or Gary was the guy who came up with voting districts that were shaped like salamanders in order to protect incumbents in Massachusetts. So that's why we call funny shaped voting districts gerrymanders. Um, but the three um, guys who refused to sign the constitutions thought it should contain a bill of rights. And James Madison initially disagreed and then he came to change his mind because there was a lot of pressure in the ratifying conventions to adopt a Bill of Rights. Madison's initial reasons for resisting it were that a Bill of Rights would be unnecessary or dangerous, unnecessary because the constitution itself was a Bill of Rights because it granted Congress no power to infringe free speech and therefore we didn't have to worry that it would. And dangerous because if you limited uh, certain numbers of rights and wrote them down, people might wrongly assume that if the right wasn't written down, it wasn't protected, but in the face of the opposition from Mason, Randolph, and Jerry, and other anti-federalists, Madison changed his mind, and the Bill of Rights was uh, proposed in uh, August and September 1789 and ratified on December 15th, 1791. Thank you, and I, I'm jumping around a little because I think that story flows really nicely, but we do actually utilize in this class, so when students take the AP government, the, the commentary that happened in between the end of the Constitutional Convention on September 17, 1787, to the ratification of the Bill of Rights. And they come out as the Federalist Papers. And there's Federalist and Anti-Federalist. So as we dive into all of those, we're going to begin by giving a little bit of love to the Anti-Federalists, because I always feel like they don't get enough attention. And Brutus Number 1 is a really important document part of the AP Gov exam and really kind of spells out fears, fears of having a government that's too strong, that's too powerful. So tell us a little bit about Brutus, Jeff, and why we should read it. Well, Brutus was a pseudonym of an anti-federalist from New York who opposed the constitution. He was probably a state judge and a member of the New York ratifying convention named Robert Yates, who was a well-known anti-federalist. He objected to the constitution for the reasons we've talked about, that it didn't have a bill of rights, and also he embraced the classical view from the Romans and Aristotle that republics could only exist in small societies. Montesquieu embraced that classical view and Brutus quotes at length from him. Montesquieu said it's natural in a republic to have a small territory, otherwise it can't long subsist. In a large republic, there are men of large fortunes and less moderation who have their own interests, who would oppress their fellow citizens, sacrifice the public good to a thousand small views, in a small one, the interest of the public is easier perceived, better understood, and more within the reach of every citizen. Abuses are uh, less protected. Remember, and this is the big difference between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, Madison rejected that classical view. He said, actually, in America, the large size of the Republic would be an advantage because it would be hard for mobs or factions to discover each other. And by the time they did, they'd be tired and go home. And the idea of representation would ensure that representatives could uh, reflect their subjects and, or rather their, their constituents' interests um, with, 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 in a large territory. 
But Brutus rejects that. He gives the classical theory. He says that it's impossible in a large republic, uh, given the clashing um, climates and manners and the diversity of the population, for people to perceive the public good in common. He's also really worried about standing armies, which are common to European monarchies, and is afraid that they're going to oppress the people. And he's worried that in a large republic, the people won't have much confidence in the legislature and will be jealous of the laws they passed. And with a concentration of power in the hands of a few, representatives will be removed from the control of the people and will abuse their power to oppress the people. It's a really interesting question, friends. Was Brutus right or not? And if we think today that the main problem of politics is polarization, which Madison would have called faction, then Brutus wasn't right. He, Brutus is worried that the, the representatives are going to be so uh, removed from the people that they're going to pursue their own interests at the expense of the people's interests. Today, arguably, representatives are too responsive, not to the people as a whole, but to mobilize factions of the people. And in that sense, the cooling mechanisms that Madison put in place to insulate our representatives from popular pressure are too weak, not too strong. So, so maybe both Brutus and Madison failed to obviously anticipate Twitter and Facebook, how could they? But the problems that we're seeing today are not the ones that either of them anticipated. And always fascinating to be able to look at these documents from these time periods and engage in a modern conversation around them. So thank you for bringing them to the modern moment, Jeff. Um, one of the reasons why the Anti-Federalists don't get as much attention is because the Federalist Papers were really highly published. They were awesome and amazing too, but there was a lot of kind of marketing behind them. So could you tell us a little bit about the Federalist Papers overall? And then we'll dive into Federalist number 10, which I know is one of your favorites. Absolutely. Well, the Federalist Papers were the equivalent of blogs, uh, or really thoughtful ma articles in the in a magazine like the Atlantic today. Um, they're they were printed in the newspapers, so they're meant to be read and written by ordinary citizens and debated by people in coffee houses and taverns and eventually at the ratifying conventions. Um, that's why it's important for you to read them, friends. I you know it's, the language can sometimes seem a little bit daunting, but remember if you were alive back in the, uh, at the end of the 18th century, you would have read these papers in school along with and discussed them with your parents and they're meant to be discussed by citizens. Um, Madison has great faith that the new broadside press technology um, like the New York Gazette and other newspapers would allow reason to spread slowly across the land in essays like the Federalist Papers, so, which could be debated by ordinary citizens. And that's why it's so important for us to read and discuss them. They're perhaps the most brilliant contribution of America to uh, the political theory of constitutionalism. They're written both by uh, Madison, by Alexander Hamilton, who, who wrote most of them, and they're probably Hamilton's greatest contribution to constitutionalism, and also a few by John Jay, who briefly served as Chief Justice. Federalist 10 is definitely the place to begin because it contains the central idea of the Federalist Papers. And that is that the main danger in a uh, democratic republic is faction. What is a faction? Um, Madison defines a faction as any group, either a majority or a minority, animated by passion rather than reason, devoted to self-interest rather than the public good. And Madison says there are a lot of causes for faction, uh, political struggles, religious struggles, uh, latent causes of faction are sh sown in the nature of, of man and human interests. Um, and it's really important not to allow these mobilized factions, which we could also call mobs, to mobilize. And that's why Shays' Rebellion is a good example of a kind of faction that the framers are trying to avoid armed debtors in Western Massachusetts mobbing the federal courthouses and refusing to pay their debts because it's not in their interest to pay their debts. They feel that inflation is so high, they can't afford to, and they basically want to get out of their obligations. And for Madison, that threatens the public good, which has to do with protecting the property rights. In fact, he, quoting John Locke, says that the protection of private property is the first 
uh, goal of government. So that's what a faction is. And Madison's solution to the problem of faction is what takes up a lot of the rest of the Federalist Papers. And that's the design of the Constitution itself. And uh, why don't we uh, turn to- I was gonna say perfect. <laughs> yeah. What should we talk about next? Which, which so I think that leads perfectly to talking about the design of the Constitution in separation of powers and checks and balances and Federalist 51, that that is going to be the remedy for tyranny. Excellent. So friends, separation of powers might seem a little abstract or you know wonky or whatever, but uh, we had a great podcast recently, a We the People podcast with some scholars of the Russian and Ukrainian constitutions. And I asked them, what's the biggest difference between the US and the Russian constitution? After all, they both have bills of rights. They have very sweeping promises of liberty and equality that you know, on, on paper, they seem really similar. What, what's the difference? And one of our, our scholars said, separation of powers. Because the, the Russian constitution is a lie. All of those beautiful words don't mean anything because all the power is in the hands of one man. Vladimir Putin. It was the separation of powers that ensured that one king or president or dictator couldn't have all the power, but instead we the people parcel out our sovereign authority among three different branches, the legislative, executive, and judiciary, and then vertically between the federal and the state government and allow each of the three branches to check and balance each other, as well as the federal and state governments to uh, check and balance each other. That dispersal of power defines the rule of law as opposed to the rule of one tyrannical man. So suddenly Federalist 51 becomes really important. It's not some boring abstraction. It's the heart of what distinguishes America from a country where one dictator can order millions of people to be killed just because he wants to. That's what's at stake here. And that's why we fought the American Revolution to prevent the dictatorial king from based on his own whim or self-interest uh, oppressing the people's liberties. It's a very big deal that we're talking here about freedom and about the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So separation of powers is a um, critical idea in Republican theory in the 18th century. We've talked about John Locke and, and Montesquieu. All of them talked about the importance of dividing powers between the legislative, executive, and the judicial power. Montesquieu said when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person, there can be no liberty, but instead uh, there's tyranny. And Federalist 51 sums up all those points. It's called the structure of government must furnish the proper checks and balances between the different departments. So let's remember that, how important the structure of government is, not just a bill of rights. Madison thinks a Bill of Rights is kind of, you know, it's nice to have, it's an extra safety, but it could be a parchment barrier, as he called it, without separation of powers, the structure of government. And you had to strengthen the national government to ensure it wasn't as weak as under the Articles of Confederation. And the key quote in Federalist 51 is the great security against a gradual concentration of the several powers in the same department consists in giving those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motives to resist encroachment of others. And here's the famous line, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. So that's a great line that I know you'll remember. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. And then Madison has another great line about, the, about human nature itself. He said, what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So let's get that again. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. We'd all just pursue the common good and act virtuously without the need to separate and check power. And if our representatives were angels, if the people who were governing us were angels, then internal and external controls wouldn't be necessary. But men aren't angels and our representatives aren't angels. And that's why we need to have separation of powers. Fantastic. And so that really, all these Federalist papers that are in this exam are trying to show the big ideas in the constitution as well as different parts. Now, the next one that we're gonna talk about Federalist 70 
talks about the need for a strong executive. And when we talked about the Articles of Confederation, Pennsylvania's um, state constitution was a great example of a weak executive and it wasn't working. So they learn their lessons, they change it in the constitution. And here in 70, they're trying to explain why the executive needs to be strong um, and needs to have power uh, and as well as limits. Do you want to dive into that a little bit more? Absolutely. You know, very well set up. And it's written by Hamilton. Hamilton wants a really strong president. He stands up in the Constitutional Convention and says, let's have a president elected for life. And there was a gasp when he suggested that. Basically, he was a, essentially, a, people called him a secret monarchist who wanted an elected king. Um, and he didn't win that. But he does, in Federal 70, defend what he calls energy in the executive. Energy is the leading character in the definition of good government. What it, he attacks the idea that a vigorous executive is inconsistent with Republican government because he says good government requires energetic administration. There are four keys, unity in the executive, duration, competent powers, and support. What does a unitary executive mean? It means a single president. That wasn't a given because as Curry said under the Pennsylvania constitution, you had a council that was, had the executive power and nothing could get done. And the unicameral legislature, one house legislature had too much power, was oppressing liberty and a multi-member executive and it just didn't work. So you need a single president characterized by decision, activity, secrecy and dispatch while making the people safer. Uh, duration meant more time in office, not just a one or two year term. Uh, um, because you want a president responsive uh, to the people and also strong enough to uh, make decisions over a period of time. And then you also need competent powers um, and support. So those are all crucial parts of the executive. And the whole reason that it worked is because everyone knew that George Washington would be the first president. When um, James Wilson proposed a single executive of one person presidency. There was also uncertainty about that, but because everyone trusted Washington so much, they were willing to create this energetic executive. Far weaker than Congress, they thought. Congress was the most dangerous branch, but strong enough to be energetic and unitary. The question was what came after Washington? And that was what led to a lot of the great debates in American history. Awesome. And then the next paper, Federalist number 78, really talks about the need for an independent judiciary and really setting up that idea. And then Jeff, can you talk about like, why was this so important to the founding generation to ensure an independent judiciary and how to be, how the, how is the judiciary independent? What makes it independent? Curry, I told you, um, and I want to tell our friends that I was in Ukraine a few years ago, right after their democratic revolution of dignity in 2014. They were forming a new constitution. And I asked, what's the most important element in the new constitution? And they said an independent judiciary. Because like Hamilton, they emphasized that unless the judiciary has a power to strike down all acts that are contrary to the tenor of the constitution, then the, then the Constitution has no enforcement mechanism. That's why Hamilton said in Federal 78 that the interpretation of the laws is the proper and peculiar province of the court. A Constitution must be regarded as judges as fundamental law. It therefore belongs to them to ascertain its meaning as well as any meaning of any particular act proceeding from the legislative body. So that leads us to the idea of judicial review, which is also in Federal 78. What does judicial review mean? It means the power of judges to strike down unconstitutional laws. And just to put this in plain language again, so we understand what we're talking about, it's really important to have independent judges who can decide if a law passed by the legislature violates the constitution, because if they can't do that, then the constitution can't be binding law. It won't be the supreme law of the land. But then the question is, where did judges get their power to strike down unconstitutional laws? And Hamilton, says that it's inherent in the nature of the fact that the constitution is supreme law. Whenever there's a clash between the will of the people represented by the constitution and the will of our legislators and representatives, which are 
embodied in ordinary laws, according to Hamilton, judges should prefer the what he calls the master to the servant, the principal to the agent. They should prefer the law that is fundamental to that that isn't fundamental. Did, 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 was, was, should, we, should I say that one more time? Because it's so important. It's the very crux of the whole power of judges to strike down unconstitutional laws. The constitution represents the will of we the people. Ordinary laws represent the will of our fallible and temporary representatives. So when there's a clash between the constitution and the ordinary law, you prefer the will of the principal, that's we the people, to the agent, our representatives. It's a very powerful statement of the need for an independent judiciary and the justification for judicial review. Of course, I, there, there's a lot to say in response to it. It's, it's all premised on the idea that the Constitution does reflect the will of we the people more accurately than that of an ordinary law. And that idea rests on the special procedures for constitutional ratification. You can pass an ordinary law simply by getting both houses of Congress to pass it and the president to sign it. But to ratify or amend the constitution, you've got to jump through a lot more hoops. You have to get by Congress or by conventions and then ratification by three quarters of the states or special conventions called in three quarters of the states. It's so much harder to do that we can be pretty confident that the constitution and its amendments represent the considered deliberative, thoughtful will of we the people more accurately than that of our representatives in the here and now. So much more to say about it, but that's the core of Federalist uh, 78, and that's why independent judges are so important. And thank you, because I've been asked that question, like what's the relationship between government, the law, and the constitution, and who kind of over supersedes over the other? So that really kind of helps spell out that relationship and how the courts play a huge role in ensuring the will of the people is being seen and that that constitution is the will of the people. Okay, one more document since we already did in a timeline, then the Bill of Rights would have came after all the Federalist papers and the Anti-Federalist writings back and forth. We did the Bill of Rights. Jeff, did you wanna nod one more second at the Bill of Rights? Cause I know I kind of zoomed you through it and then we'll get to our final document, but we do have follow-up questions for you, Jeff. So be, hold some time for that too. <laughs> Sounds great. I, th I think we're good on the Bill of Rights. Uh, and I think our final document is the letter from the Birmingham, Birmingham Jail. Is that right? Absolutely, which I know is one of your favorites. Oh, it's so moving. It was, it was written in 1963. Dr. King is defending the strategy of nonviolence. 13 days earlier, there's boycotts and sit-ins in Birmingham. King is arrested on April 12th for his nonviolent protests. And in jail, under brutal conditions, he writes this beautiful sublime, inspirational letter addressing his critics. He says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. It's, it's so beautiful, friends, and it's such a powerful statement, both of King's Christian faith, which was central to his vision of serving the other, and also to the Greek vision of agape, which King invokes. Agape basically means selfless love, not romantic love, not, uh, love of friendship, but love for our fellow, uh, our fellow citizens, our fellow men, our fellow women, our brothers and sisters. All men are brothers and sisters because we all share this divine spark uh, that uh, is inherent in who we are as human beings. And Dr. King is saying that that divine spark that we all share binds us in an inescapable network of mutuality. Um, and that is why he points to St. Augustine and to Thomas Aquinas to justify civil disobedience and says that a submit that an individual who uh, breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. It's so crucial to King as to Augustine and to um, uh, Aquinas, 
that you have a moral responsibility to ignore unjust laws for an unjust law is no law at all. He cites not only the biblical story of disobeying the laws of Nebuchadnezzar, but also Hitler's Germany and the genocidal murder of the Jews. And King says everything Hitler did in Nazi Germany was technically legal because of course you can have a rule of law that a wicked dictator bends to his own will. But we have an independent obligation to judge the morality of laws according to the dictates of our conscience. And King says today in 63, segregation laws are immoral and unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Um, and then King says, you might call the civil rights movement extreme, but Jesus and other great reformers were extremists, including Martin Luther, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. And King quotes from the Declaration of Independence. And he says, the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? And then finally, it's just so meaningful to share his beautiful language. He writes that, uh, I should have realized that a few members of a race that has oppressed another race can understand or appreciate the deep groans and passionate yearnings of those that have been oppressed. Still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. And he calls on all Americans, white and black, to recognize uh, the path to justice and freedom in the righteous cause of the civil rights movement. Beautiful expression of the creed of the Declaration of King's devotion to nonviolence, which he got from Aquinas, uh, Thoreau, and also Mahatma Gandhi, and the beautiful Greek and uh, notion of agape and universal love. It is a beautiful one to end on, too. Um, but we do have a few follow up conversations. So, so much of the AP Gov exam ask the students to compare and contrast these documents. And so Ashley um, asked that same question. So can you tell us where we see similarities and where we see differences between the documents? And I figured when we talk about the letter from a Birmingham jail and King in general, we can easily connect that circle back to the um, Declaration of Independence and this idea of I am alive, I exist, therefore I have rights that no government can tread on. It's so crucial, and, and King was such a, a declarationist, as, as some call it, someone who viewed the entire American ideal has been expressed in the promise of the declaration, but thought it took not only the Reconstruction Amendments, but the Civil Rights Movement to make the promise a reality. And the same year as the letter of Birmingham Jail, he stands on the mall and says, I have a dream, and says the declaration is a promissory note in the Constitution and the civil rights movement are necessary to make it a reality. So it's very important that King is seeing the protests of the civil rights movement, not as a rejection of the declaration and the constitution, but as their perfection, their completion. And he insists that America make good on its promise that all people are created equal. And then the Federalist Papers really give the the meat and the weight behind the Constitution. So you can almost see the Constitution as the umbrella and the Federalist Papers as explainers to that umbrella and then the fear of that um, document as well, correct? Yes, explainers is a great way to put it. And, um, you know, Colin asks, what's the significance that they were published in newspapers for normal Americans to read? The significance, Colin and friends, is that you have an obligation to read them too. They're written for you. They're not just something to be studied for your AP exam because you've got to get through the test. There's something to be learned from to understand the essence of citizenship. It's really exciting to read the federal papers. And I know it's not, they're not a quick read. It's not easy uh, for me or Curry either because the language is dense but it's so worthwhile. Just do some slow reading, just take, take the time. And, and you know what, read, read the whole thing. They're not that long. The ones that we've recommended are the greatest hits of the Federalist Papers. So if you just want, just for your own growth to this weekend to read Federalist 10, Federalist 51, Federalist 70, and Federalist 78, all the way through from beginning to end, 
I think you'll feel like you've developed a superpower, which is that you you know you can do it. That you just take take the time. Don't you know browse or do, do anything else except focus on on reading the fellows' papers. And then and and I and I know that you'll understand them if you just read them slowly. You'll get past the unfamiliar language and you'll get what they're saying, and you'll feel so empowered. So it's really exciting to read the fellows' papers, and I hope you do. And we will help you out by sending you links to every single one of them. So you don't even have to find them. We will find them for you and send them out. Okay, one final question. And Bonnie and Cal kind of asked a similar question. It's wrapped around Federalist 10. Um, and so what Cal says is knowing the importance of avoidance of factions in Federalist 10, do you think that our government has done a good job protecting Americans against factions? And they both asked the question about bipartisanship and parties. And has that in some way created a system where the people aren't being as heard and there's too much power in one area and one realm? Well, it's a central question of our civic life today. And I think I'd say, you know, it's not the government's job to protect us from factions, it's the constitution's job. And the whole point of the constitution is to avoid the formation of factions and to slow down deliberation so that the, the, by the time mobilized factions or mobs discover each other, they'll get tired and go home or passions will cool and reason can prevail. The problem is that all of the speed bumps and cooling mechanisms of the constitution are being undermined by things like social media, which has sped up deliberation to warp speed and also empowered the most radical and vocal extremists among us to get the most attention. So on Facebook and Twitter, both fake news travels farther and faster than real news, and the most mobilized extremists get the most likes and retweets, um, leaving the moderate middle unheard. And the result of all that is that our representatives are playing to their bases in the factions in a way that would have been Madison's nightmare because he thought that representatives shouldn't communicate directly with factions, but instead should participate with them in a thoughtful, calm conversation about things like the Federalist Papers that would allow reason rather than passion to prevail. And in addition, in addition to social media, we've just become very polarized in terms of our political views. And Americans are more polarized today than at any time since the Civil War. And part of that is the fact that we're all watching the same polarized news channels and reading the same polarizing algorithms. So what's the solution? It's not for the government to protect us. It's for you to empower yourself to take the time to do exactly what you're doing right now, which is to take a half hour or 45 minutes in the middle of the day to read complicated but important arguments to listen to arguments on different sides, to hear people you disagree with so that you can have a thoughtful conversation rather than a Twitter war and can open your mind and open yourself up to the possibility of deviating from your faction or expressing your independent thoughts. That is the most precious thing you can do as, as, a, as an American, as a human being, as a citizen, as a person to exercise your freedom of conscience, to think for yourself and to speak as you think, as Brandeis and Jefferson said. So this is very important what you're doing. It's of course the AP exam is important and I'm so proud of all of you for taking AP history and I know you're gonna do great on the exam because you're such wonderful learners, but it's what we're talking about here is more important than just the AP exam. It's, it's being a, a good citizen, which means being a lifelong learner and, and being open to the views not of factions and of the loudest voices, but of the cool voice of reason. And that's exactly what you're gonna do. And I just wanna say thank you for being open to being a lifelong learner. Awesome, thank you so much. And I think that was such a great echo if any of our students did join us last week with Robbie George and the week before that with Urban Turaninsky, they said the same thing. You know, spend time reading, spend time talking to people who think differently and have a conversation. So Jeff, what a great way to kind of pull this all together and remind us that all these documents are also telling us that we not only get rights, but we have a duty and responsibility in this system of government 
in this constitution and to really understand the documents and live them. So fantastic. We got through all 10. A wonderful. I appreciate it. And thank you students so much. Good luck for those of you who are taking the AP exam and good luck to those who are just studying these awesome documents. Completely. Good luck, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Get some sleep. Do not be anxious. And we're so proud of you and so uh, uh, grateful to you for taking the time to learn with us. So good luck on the exam and have a, have a great weekend. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. Good luck, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.